Good morning, everyone. Uh, happy Friday to you, wherever you happen to be. Hello, Debbie. Hello, Elisa. Hello, Letiza. Ciao. Hello, Paula from sunny Florida. Uh, hello, Giovanni. Ciao. Alisa, I can't believe it's December either. It's gone so quick. I remember when, it, when we first started this, um, probably the first session was going over the color chart, and that was back in March. So it has really gone quickly. It's amazing. Hello, Sue from San Francisco. Hello, Sandra. Hello, Tarun. Tarun is from India. Fantastic. Good to see you, Tarun. Hello, Marie from Charleston, South Carolina. A beautiful, beautiful place. Okay. So today, um, Thursdays and Fridays are duplicates of each other. And that just because I know some of you, because of time, because it's going around the world, um, some of, some for some people this makes more sense. Um, so it's the same as what we went over yesterday. And also, um, both of them, um, both videos you can replay as many, many times as you want. I make them uh, viewable. So if there's anything you would like to know, please leave a comment. I read the comments uh, prior to doing the next session and I'll answer your question um, if I don't answer it online. Today what we're gonna, we're gonna begin with is we're going to go over the color chart again and I go over the color chart because for every artist um, every watercolor artist or oil artist uh, we have we have color charts for both understanding the the color chart is very very pow very powerful it allows you as an artist um, to have a, a, a very strong tool in your toolbox it allows you over a cup of coffee to envision which colors you might want to use for example, because watercolor is really a light to dark medium, once you get to opaque, your story is over. You can look and, and um, if you want a granulating color, you can say a yellow. You can pick a granulating yellow. You can pick a non-granulating yellow. You can pick a transparent yellow. You can pick a semi-opaque yellow. So there's lots of choices you can make as an artist um, about what color you want to use to accomplish your vision. And that's what we're going to go over today. Hello, hello, Anika from Sweden. So Sue says, do you make watercolor pencils or have plans to? Um, Sue, we don't make watercolor pencils and right now I don't have a plan to. We will be going over the watercolor sticks, which is more of a pen in your hand. We'll be discussing those in, in later sessions, um, but not a watercolor pencil per se. Okay, so let us begin. I'm gonna put this down so you can see. Flip this around. The color chart is available online. Um, it may or may not be available at a local retailer that carries Daniel Smith near you. But they are available to the retailers. You can always ask. So the important thing I wanted to point out very quickly is this legend and we'll be using this legend let me get this down further so you can see here we go and what the legend is going to tell, talk about are these symbols down here which I, which I will go over with you so the legend says um, what they're available in and like again I'll show you where that's at it says what the light fastness is so and that's either a one, a two, a three, or a four. And I know that's kind of blurry. Let me see if I can get it even further down to allow you to see it. There we go. Maybe that's a little bit better. Okay, so light fast is a one, two, three, or four. Light first, light fastness and permanence are the same. Okay, so some people will talk light fastness, some people will, will talk permanence. In the paint industry, we talk light fastness. And the next thing that we'll go over and that you can find 
is whether it is staining, whether it, the paint, is staining or non-staining, and then whether it granulates or doesn't granulate, and then what the transparency is, and then whether it's a Primatech, denoted by this P symbol right here, Primatech. That means I make them from minerals myself, process them into pigment, and um, from there make them into paint. So Johnny, yes, I, I will, during this session, talk about mine colors. Oh, Nancy picked up two copies at Artisan Craftsman. Very, that's very, very cool. Awesome. Okay, so let's begin with, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the color chart as we go, as we go on. But we're going to start with buff titanium right here, buff titanium. Okay, so buff titanium. And let me show you what that looks like. This is buff titanium. I'll bring the camera up in a second so you can actually um, see it in greater detail. You can see that buff titanium has granulation. You can see the granulation. Um, this is one to 10 parts to get this washed. That means one part paint by weight to 10 parts water by weight. So say if it was a gram of paint I was using, I'd be using 10 grams of distilled water. And then I create a mixture, and then I do a wash with it. So we'll be looking at these in greater detail in a moment here. So let's come back to the information. So what this says, it has what the common name is, and the common name here is buff titanium. Let me see if I can make that a little bit better for you. I don't know why it doesn't want to get that. The next line says what it's available in. That says available. And it's available in 15 mil, 5 mil. It's available in stick, which means the uh, stick is the pan in your hand. And it's available in half pan. Right here it says HP, half pan. Okay? And every single one says what they're available in. We, we note that right here. Okay, the next line is gets back to our legend and this is how we learn about the particular pigment and color so buff titanium is a one this is a roman numeral one which means it is a hundred plus years and not only does the manufacturer say it's a hundred plus years but we have our own xenon fadeometer at daniel smith i have several chemists and my chemists have all the tools to be able to test every aspect of color. So we we don't rely on what somebody says. We'll go and use our own equipment to prove what it is. Because at the end of the day, it's our name on the tube, not the name of the person that has the pigment. So this is a one, which means it's been tested by us out to 100 plus years. Then there's a number one right here. The number one means that this is non-staining. And I will show you what non-staining looks like. This has a Y, which means it's granulating. So if there's any, if there's even a little bit of granulation, we will put Y. And if it says N for no, it means there is absolutely no granulation. Hello, Maria from the Netherlands. What is the, let's see, what is, what is? So for measuring, we use, you, know, you can use a, a, a really good, for, so we use um, scientific um, scales. And they're probably anywhere between, um, on the low side, $900 to several thousand dollars. You don't need to do that. You can, you can use a, um, a regular scale and weigh out, you can do two grams. Two grams is actually quite a bit of, bit of um, bit of paint uh, but you don't really need to do the, the washes you can buy our dot card and use enough water to wet it out and that would still give you an excellent idea of what the pigment looks like in fact I would highly recommend the dot cards for the, about the size of two tubes of paint you can test out 238 colors it's a, just a really easy way to do it um, we'll be doing that in, in later on uh, videos 
So let's look at buff titanium again. It also says that it's PW, which means pigment white. Pigment white, that's a W. So pigment white number six, colon one. So now let's go over this information. Let me show it to you what each thing means. Okay. So we're going to say that buff titanium is a, a number one for staining. Here's what staining is. I'm going to raise this up a little bit. Okay. So what I want to show you here is staining to non-staining. If we look at if we look at cobalt violet, so cobalt violet. If I laid a cobalt violet wash down and I took a wet brush, I can remove the paint almost completely. I mean it's it's 99% gone. That's because this is a non-staining color. So it's a one, which means non-staining. So that color, that, that number that we're seeing when we look at buff titanium, the second number, which is a one, that means it is non-staining. Okay. If it were a two, it would mean it'd be slightly staining. So Hansa yellow medium, for example, is slightly staining. You can see a little bit of a tint of yellow in here, just a tiny, tiny bit. So it's a two, it's very low staining. If we go to endanthrone blue, which is a three, it's medium staining, which means you can see a lot more of the blue. See, you can see more of the blue. And then if we go to um, carmine, it's a four, it's highly staining, right? So we can see it's highly staining. It'd be, it's very difficult to remove with a wet brush. And that's what it means. So a one means it's non-staining, very easy to remove. A two means it's low staining. You remove almost all of it, but you see a very, very slight tint. Three, it is staining, it's medium, but you're gonna see way more than a light tint. You're gonna actually see more of the color. And then four is pretty much, it's not gonna move. Highly staining. Hi John, would you post that staining chart? Absolutely, Mary, that's a good idea and I will do that. I like that, very good idea. And so over a cup of coffee, if you wanted to do, for example, um, you wanted to remove a color, uh, say you're doing a wash and you wanted to remove a, a piece of your wash to put another color in, in its place, um, then you'd want to use a non-staining color because you can remove it and add another color in here. If you used a highly staining color, you couldn't do that, that technique because you wouldn't be able to remove the color. Okay, so now, now let's take a look at the characteristic of transparency. So remember back to our buff, we have this circle which is half and half, which means it's semi, whoops, there we go, which means it's semi-transparent, okay? versus, for example, the Vandate Van yellow, which is opaque. See that dark circle? That means it's opaque. Or an open circle, for example, lemon yellow, is fully transparent, okay? So transparent, semi-opaque, and opaque. All right, so let's go over that for a second. I'm gonna bring this back up again. And here we have, with quinacridone burnt orange, this is white, this is a white strip, and this is a black strip, okay? So this, this paper, before I put any color on it, had the natural paper, which is white, and then I put a black strip. Then I put a color over the top of it. When I put transparent quinacridone burnt orange, it's a transparent color. I can see the burnt orange over the white, and here, I don't see it, I just see the black. So what that's showing is, it's transparent. That's why I see this as dark black. So now let's go to semi-transparent. Semi-transparent, I'm still gonna see it over the white. And you can see here, you can kinda see the red because it's semi-transparent. So the red is 
taking place and covering up some of the black. And then over here, the last one, this one is opaque. Okay, this is chromium green oxide. You can see it on the white and it's hard to see here on this with this, but this right here is all green. It looks black for, because this camera, but it's, it's all green. So what that means, it's opaque. It has covered up the black. Let me see if I can show, I don't know how I can show that to you, but take my word for it. This is green. Maybe if I make this higher, let me just make that higher and there, you're seeing some more there. That's probably better. There we go. The camera wants to um, adjust for the brightness and it makes it dark, but see, it's green which means this is opaque. It has covered up the black. It's opaque. You need to be at the end of your story if you use an opaque color. I could use a good cup of coffee. I'm in Seattle, so all we have is good coffee, supposedly. That is probably not always true. Italy has probably the best coffee. Okay, so those are, those are two of the main characteristics. Um, the light fastness, I can't show you because we'd have to come back in a hundred plus years and and probably none of us are going to do that if you do god bless you um but i can show you and will show you granulation so now let's take a look let's take a look at granulation mary some brands use semi-opaque to add another step between semi-transparent and opaque semi-transparent and semi-opaque would be the same for us at Daniel Smith. Um, also, Debbie said that too. What's the difference between semi transparent, semi opaque? Um, for us, it would be the half circle, half black, half white. So it would be the same Debbie, it would be the same Mary. Um, there's probably five different categories you can use. We use, we use the three categories. So I'm about to read this other question here. I would post that yes. Um, so we don't use mica powder. Um, our luminescence, which I'll, which I'll go over toward the end of this um, session today, um, is mica that is incorporated into the luminescence and or it's a natural pigment. I will show you both. <laughs> okay. So here we go. This is to show you what granulation looks like. And granulation is caused by differential specific gravity. It means there's something within the pigment uses because it's more than one pigment. And some are lighter and some are heavier and they run down the paper differently. Um, someone asked yesterday, it was a really good question. If I use a smooth paper, which is hot press paper, um, do I get granulation? If something granulates, you will always get granulation. This is Lana Acquarell 140 cold, cold Press. So it has valleys that the paint can travel down. That's why you get this, this really leather looking like um, shape, very beautiful shape. Let me get some light on that for you. There we go. If this were a, a hot press paper or smooth, it would be like a droplet of water. It would hit and it would radiate out. So the um, particles, you'd see, you'd see the differentiation of particles from heavy to light. The light would go out further in a radial pattern. And the heavier would stay in the center. So it would, it would radiate out like a raindrop hitting the cement driveway. Okay, That's what would happen on hot press paper. But if something granulates, it always granulates. And it's a really a neat technique just to play with. George Politis uses it. Um, Giovanni, who's on right now, uses it. A lot of artists use it. It's, it's kind of a, a zen kind of thing. It's, it's not something you want to force. It's something you want to, you just want to, um, to play with the energy and move the energy along. So these are, this is a lunar. And we'll talk more about the effect of lunar black. It's an unbelievable color. We'll go over that in the future. This is lunar black, and you can see the heavy, heavy, heavy granulation. So super heavy granulation, okay? Super heavy. It's unique in that it's a single pigment which granulates. It's a single synthetic pigment that granulates. 
something you would never expect to see because they're all the same weight, they're all the same size, they're all the same shape. And I'll go over the chemistry of what makes that happen at a later time. This is lunar Earth. It's more than one pigment. And you get that granulation. Lunar blue, again, that awesome granulation. Lunar Earth, same granulation. Lunar red rock, again, heavy granulator. And then we have um, lunar violet, which is a heavy granulator, and one that maybe many of you have used, and this is moon glow. And moon glow is made up of three pigments, ultramarine, viridian, and anthraquinoid red. So it's it is a it's a really awesome granulator. Let's see if I can get that color in there for you. Oh, I gotta play with that. There it goes this way. It's a really awesome granulator. And here is a, a brown iron oxide. So iron oxides um, can be found naturally. They can also be found synthetically. But it's a really awesome granulator. Okay. Now here is isoindoline. And it is a non-granulator. And you can see um, here in front of me, it's extremely bright and vibrant. It's not so much on the screen. Um, this is bright white paper, and you can see it's it's kind of darkish over here. Where am I pointing for you to see? Over here, uh, and over here, it's kind of darkish. This is bright white paper, so I think it's just too much for this camera to handle. Um, but anyway, zero granulation. So a lot of the, the almost I would say all. Um, the paint that's made for the car industry, you're not going to get any type of granulation because granulation in the car industry is called a recall. Um, so they're just high performance, perfect pigments, um, all the same size, all the same shape, all the same weight, and there's no granulation. Alrighty. Okay, so those are, those are now the characteristics. And I'm going to show you So when we look, the coatings industry comes up with how the, how the pigments are um, categorized by what, what family of pigments they put them into. Let me put this down here so you can see. Okay, so this, let's see if we can do it that way. This actually says, PW, PW6 colon 1. PW means pigment white number 6 colon 1. The first thing is always P for pigment. So every one of those says that. Maybe I can go down even further. Let me see if I can do that. That's, that's kind of better. So pigment white number 6 colon 1. That's buff titanium. If we go over to here, and here's titanium, it is PW6, pigment white number six. So let me show you some things here. I'm going to bring this back up again. This is titanium white. Okay. Right here, it's a little bit hard for you to see, but this is titanium white over white paper. You can kind of see the dark lines. Okay, I put it over black so you can see it better. So this is titanium white, PW6. This is buff titanium. This is PW6. So look at, look at this line, buff titanium and titanium white. This is PW6 colon 1, shade 1, and this is PW6. Don't quite look a whole lot alike, do they? And then this is gray titanium. This is PW6. So literally, this is PW6, this is PW6, 
and this is PW6 colon 1. Realistically, this should have been called PW6 colon 2 by the industry, but they didn't do that. And we're going to go into some of the strange things of how things are named and in what categories they go. If you like that, um, if you like that, then this is going to be very interesting for you. I probably should have prefaced this whole thing by saying I'm not an artist. I am um, always amazed by what you can do as an artist. Um, some of you, I've seen your your artwork. Um, it always it, it always amazes me. And I, I don't have that um, talent, uh, but I can mix colors pretty well. And I know the, the physics and the chemistry very well. And so that's what I'm going to go be going over. Things that make the, what makes the color, what the colors look like, etc. So let me read some of your questions here. Um, can the same pigment be ground more finely to have both granulating and non-granulating paint? Or is it an inherent property of the pigment? So Sue, it's an, it's an inherent property. It's an inherent um, constituent of the pigment. And that's a fantastic question. So um, you can actually change, and I'll go over this at a later time. I'll show you the difference between ultramar ultramarine blue and French ultramarine. You can change the uh, refraction index of a color by how you grind it. So for us, the art is making sure we always get the paint to the same, the same micron level every time so there is continuity of color that that's a beautiful question it's a loaded question very very good question um so jeanette the color chart is available we make those available but it would be at the retailer you'd have to ask the retailer and the retailer should be able to get it for you i understand that the downloaded one um, the downloaded colors are never quite the same if you wanted something even better um, it's really the 238 dot card is probably even the best because you absolutely get to see and feel the paint. I think what most people who who think about artists, they always say it's a visual. It is absolutely a visual, but it's also a tactile because you're you're pushing color with water, etc., through that brush to get the refraction and reflection. So I think it's it's a two. It's a two-sided piece. It is the visual, but it's also the tactile, and the, the dots give you both of those. Um, so Sandra's correct. It's it's the the granulation is is inherent within the pigment. Um, now that's only true for really um, the lunar black. The most of them is because it's within the pigments that make up the paint. For example, Moon Glow is granulating because it contains three pigments. It contains the alizarin crimson, it contains the viridian, and it contains the ultramarine. And because it's three pigments that have different weights and different shapes, it granulates. So, uh, Mari, Ma, Ma, Mari, it's this is kind of the same, oh, so you're, you're responding to Sue, thank you for doing that. Okay. So that was the story of a little bit of the titaniums. And let me go over one more time because I want to make sure that you, you get this. So please do this with me. We're going to be talking just for a moment about quinethalone. Quinethalone yellow. And this is it. Let me raise this up. It's actually a very beautiful yellow. It looks a little bit washed out on the screen, but here in front of me, it is extremely violent. <laughs> violent. It's extremely vibrant. Um, and you can see my paper, which is actually a bright white, looks very dull. So that kind of tells you what it's doing to the to the paint I'm showing you as well. So quinethalone. Let's look at quinethalone. Let me get it over here for you. Okay, quinethalone yellow. It's gonna be right here. Let me put this down. Put down even further, put down as far as it'll go. Okay. Quinethalone yellow, right here. Okay. So let's do this one together. So the common name for this particular, for this, for this color, is called quinethalone yellow. 
it's a single pigment. And the rule of thumb is if it's a single pigment, it's, it's called the name of the creator. And if that happens to be a chemistry house, if that happens to be a pigment house, if that happens to be um, whatever, if it's a if it's if it has a single pigment, that means that somebody created it and it's given the name they wanted. So this is called quinethalone yellow. It says right here what it's available in. It's only available in one size. It's available in 15 millimeter, 15 milliliter, right here, 15 milliliter. So now let's go over, let's go over the symbols. So why don't you say it with me? What does a two mean? So a two, if we go over here and if we're looking at our index, I'm going to put this over here so you can see it. And there we have two. Two is very good. And it's a hundred years. That means we've used our xenon phenomer and we've tested out to a hundred years. That could be four to seven days. Okay, so let's come back. And the next thing we have, it says a two. So remember what a two is. What we'd expect in our mind's eye over a cup of coffee. If we saw a two, we would think very low staining. So very low staining and that we'd see a very slight little tint. Very, very, very slight. This is what we would think over our cup of coffee just by knowing the different types of staining. Okay, so it's a two. We'd expect very light staining. The next one says an N. N means non-granulating. And so when we look at it, we see no granulation. So these are just been, by looking at symbols, we can create this in our mind's eye, what the, what the color would actually look like. Okay. And the next it says it is semi-transparent. So I could probably put two to three other colors with this um, before I would get anything that would look like mud. Okay. It's, so it's, it's very good. It's, it's going to be good at doing... Um, not as good as transparent, but I can probably do two or three layers before I have any type of um, mud. All right, so that's how we would read all of these. Oh, by the way, this big number here that circle is a circle three, and here's a circle two right here. That's just the series. So the lower the series, the 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 loss, the the lower cost of the paint. Um, we have the majority. We have 260 colors. The majority of them are are one and twos. Okay, um, because we manufacture, I try to keep the cost um, as low as I can. There are pigments which are extremely expensive, and that's what, what that's what makes them threes and fours is because the pigment is so um, expensive. So Jan, um, it will eventually, so Jan says, will the Seattle store reopen? Um, it will eventually. Right now, I can't operate a store on a 20% staff. Um, and if my staff have to go outside to deliver packages, um, then we're not we're not servicing our customers in the store, so it's it's very difficult right now. We we're getting ready to open before we went into the uh, the lockdown that we're in right now. So Melina says, "What on what? Some colors sort of push the colors, sort of push the colors um, under them more strongly than others just blend." So Melina, that's very true, and that's that's an issue of what's called surface tension. And in a later time, we'll talk about surface tension. Surface tension allows some colors to come into a color, and surface tension allows other colors to push colors away. And we'll we'll go over that effect um, during um, another session. So great. Those are the questions that are just beautiful questions, and it's a very very good observation on your part.
Um, clear three colors. So if you're going to be on the road, so Francine says um, she travels on the road and has limited space. You can do the same thing, Francine, that we do with dot cards. You can put a good amount of, of paint down and let it dry and create your own dot card. And if it's the size of a nickel, for example, that would be quite a lot of paint when it's dried. And we also have now we have pans and sticks that make it very, very easy to travel with. OK, so let me go on and we do have which i'll be going over with you greater some some different types of colors so let's let me show you quickly so i will discuss um, surface tension at, and a lot of other characteristics um, as we go forward they are really they're quite interesting so this is cascade green and cascade green is a co-precipitated pigment it's two pigments that are put together, they're locked together, and then when you add water, it breaks them apart. And that's why you can get kind of this yellowish, greenish, bluish looking um, color. And we're gonna go over that, we're gonna go over that concept um, further. Rose of Ultramarine, there's quite a few others. So um, there'll be lots for us to discuss and go over as we go forward, okay? So Melody, there's not a chart that goes over surface tension. There's not a lot of people that really want to um, to learn about it. Um, I'm, I'm always stoked that you know you, Mary, and other people want to learn more about it. That's that kind of twinges my heart in a good way. Um, and we will be going over it, uh, but no, there's not. Okay, and then there's there's colors. So our colors are very light fast. We have 260 colors. I'll show you some of the Primatech here in a moment and the luminescent. But let me show you the two colors that we have that are fugitive. And fugitive would be a four. Remember, one, two, three, four for light fastness or permanence. So these would be a four. And it's not that one. <laughs> it's this one. Here we go. So it's, it's a Lizarin Crimson and opera pink. Um, opera pink I made because the Botanical Society, when I met with them in Denver, really wanted a very vibrant color, and they had suggested um, this sort of a pink. And it's not something I would normally do, and I put it off for years, but I, but I finally made it. They're phenomenal artists. The Botanical Society is made up of phenomenal artists, and they just wanted something that they could take pictures of um, for, their, for their books. So I came up with opera pink. It is a fugitive color. So 15 to 20 years. Now, if you put it outside of um, direct sunlight or you put UV, uh, UV um, um, conservation glass on it, it's gonna last longer. And then there's alizarin crimson. Alizarin crimson is a coal tar derivative. C-O-A-L coal tar, T-A-R coal tar derivative. And it's fugitive. It's a beautiful color. It's a color the masters used. It's actually a very, very good uh, selling color for Daniel Smith. And it's because uh, professors and teachers have their students use colors the masters used, and this is one of them. We also have a permanent version of Alizarin Crimson. So if you like the color, but you want a permanent version, 100 plus years, we have that. If you wanted to paint like the masters, you could also use this. So. Um, those are the two that we have that are fugitive. Only two colors, these two right here. The opera pink's a little bit interesting in that the opera pink is, is, is made with a secondary pigment, and you can look on the color chart and see this. It's made with quinacridone magenta. Quinacridone magenta um, is one of those 100 plus years pigments. So in the presence of light, when the fluorescent part of the opera pink goes away, you'll see the quid magenta underneath because this is made from two pigments. One which is very light fast, one which is not light fast. Hello Stella. Okay, so I think that, that now we've gone over the main concepts. Um, as you think about it and you have questions, please let me know. So Melody, I don't have any. What I can do 
is I could put that the next time we run tests on pigment, I could put up my xenon phadometer. The issue, however, is we run it to the, we run it to the color um, isn't there. And for any type of pigment, which is the majority of ours, one or two, um, it's not it's never going to go away. Um, so the only two that would go away would be um, the alizarin crimson and the uh, opera pink. And that will take considerably considerable time. Before we go on and I go over the um, the different colors, let me let me I wrote some stuff down because I just wanted to make sure I covered this really well with you. So opacity, I'm I'm asked quite a quite a bit. What is opacity and what causes it? So opacity is pigment specific and it refers to the particle size, the particle shape, and the refractive index. Okay, Opa opacity. It's pigment specific, as we saw here, pigment specific. It's by particle size, particle shape, and the refractive index. That's what causes opacity. Staining. Staining, same thing. It's called, it's pigment specific. Pigment specific. It's caused by particle size, particle shape, and pigment strength. <clears throat> some particles are shaped like little starfish, and some are super, super small, and they get under the weave of the paper, <clears throat> and they won't release. That causes those to be more staining than others. Okay, so that's the why of a passing that's the why of staining light fastness is also pigment specific and light fastness is how the pigment is affected by UV light ultraviolet light another one that we're going to talk about is organic versus inorganic pigment what makes these different so organic pigments are anything that contains carbon, usually with a oxygen, hydrogen, or nitrogen. They're very, very strong. They're medium to high staining. They have little to no granulation, and they're light fast. Organic pigments, so two that organic but can contain a metal, are the phthalo blue and phthalo green. It's the one thing you can actually um, when a bet with your friends is which organic pigments contain a metal and those would be the um, phthalo turquoise, phthalo blue turquoise actually be the phthalo blue and the phthalo green turquoise the inorganic so inorganic means it contains a metal and they're usually red, yellow, black or iron oxides, cobalt pigments titanium, etc. They're weaker in strength than organics. They're low staining and most of these granulate. And then another question was on synthetic versus natural. Synthetic natural synthetic means they're made in the laboratory for the most part. So anything for the automobile automobile industry, the quinacridones, the pyrroles, the perylenes, those are going to be perfect. Um, they're going to be synthetic. However, you can have iron oxides like yellow ochres, raw siennas, burnt umbers. They can be synthetic or natural. And we'll go over all these different things as we go on. Um, so synthetic pigments can take 15 to 30 steps to process. And again, that's what costs the money is the amount of steps um, it takes to process a pigment is then put into the cost of the pigments that I purchase. Um, Quinacridones are very, very expensive because they take over 25 different steps. Natural pigments, ochre, siennas, for example, have at least one step always because one step is just washing them to get rid of the dirt. But it can be one to five steps on a natural. Okay. So let's look at the color chart one more time. I'm, 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 also trying to read your questions here because I want to make sure I get back to you. So this is from Sue and she says, what, what binder format tube versus stick versus 
um, affect the light facet of a specific pigment. Um, so I won't speak to watercolor pencils because for the most part watercolor uh, watercolor pencils they're really not in the same they're not in the same category um, as tubes, pans, or sticks. So I'm gonna leave watercolor pencils off. But for the others, um, our binder is gum arabic, and gum arabic. Um, We use it because it's um, it's not so. Uh, and uh, honey, for example, would be hydrophilic. It, it would always make the, the the color tacky in the presence of moisture. Um, because we use the gum arabic and it dries completely, you're actually watercolors really see what the pigment looks like more than any other uh, medium. If you have oils then the artist is seeing the pigment within a linseed matrix. And that's gonna have different refraction and different reflection properties. If it is a um, acrylic, it's gonna be seen through a polymer. Again, it's gonna bend light differently. When light comes down, it's gonna bend differently within that vehicle. So watercolor, watercolor and watercolorists really see what the pigment looks like the most. Once the once the water evaporates, I mean that is the pigment. Um, it doesn't have anything to do really with light fastness. It has to do with the um, vibrancy of the color, if you will. Um, light fastness again is ca is is a is a product and a process of the actual pigment. So within our colors, whether it is a oil because we still make oil, traditional oil color and water soluble oils. Um, the sticks, the pans, the tubes, all have the same pigment. I can't speak for other people. Ours use all the same pigments. So all the pigments are highly light fast. And then you would see a difference between cascade green in oil versus cascade green in watercolor. And that's just because um, in the oils, it's ha the light has to go through the linseed oil and it's going to bend. So you get a different refre reflection and refraction index. So Claudia asks, does the refractive index change if you add more water or less water? Yes. Right? It, and, and the reason it does that, Claudia, is if you add more water, you're pushing the you're pushing the pigments out. You're diluting the pigments. There's not as many pigments within a certain area. Say it's a square centimeter. Um, if you add more water, you're going to push more of those particles out of that square centimeter, and therefore you're going to have less particles to reflect and ref and refract. So the answer to that is yes. So you might see that as um, you might see that as diluting, for example. You know, when you touch um, your watercolor with very with very little water and you put it on, it's very dark, right? Extremely dark. And if you put, you touch that down and add a bunch of water, it looks lighter than the one that's above it. So that's showing you that you're changing the index. Very good questions. Very, very, very good questions. I love your questions. If you're if you're in any way um, don't want to put a question so other people can read it, then just do it afterwards and leave it to me, and I'll, I'd love to read it. Okay, so what we see here, make sure I have it so you can read it, is the two hundred and so these are the general colors. They're beautiful colors. We have 260 colors. We have 260 colors. These are the general colors. And then if I flip this over, and over time, I'm going to go over every single one of these. So you'll see every single one. And you'll see the different families. You'll see the pyrroles, the perylenes. You'll see the cobalts, um, you'll see the quinacridones, 
We'll go over all the different families. Here we see the Primatec. So these are the Primatec colors. Here are the Primatec. These are made from minerals, and then from the minerals are processed into pigment. I have a company that I own that does this. And then I take the pigment and I make color out of it. So these are the Primatec. They're denoted by a P. They're denoted by the P, which is, just means it's P for Primatec. So if you're looking on a rack and you want to know which ones are Primatec, you just look for the P on the label. P as in Paul. Let me see if I can get this to where you can see it. There we go. P as in Paul, right there. Okay. I get a question asked quite a bit, and people say, well, are, are minerals, um, are they uh, light fast? Are they permanent? Um, there's nothing, nothing more permanent than a mineral. Um, quinacridones have been around, I believe, since the um, late to very early 60s. That's 1960. Um, minerals, when you pick up a mineral off the ground, it has been around for millennia, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years, and they don't fade. Minerals don't fade. There's nothing more light fast than a mineral. So what you see is going to last, you know, we test it to 100 plus years. It's going gonna, it's gonna to last thousands of years. And if it doesn't last thousands of years, you bring it back to me. <laughs> But it's, all kidding aside, it's going to last forever. Min minerals are just phenomenal. And then we're going, to, we're going to look at each one of these and the different characteristics. The really neat characteristics of the Primatex is their granulation. They really, really, really granulate. So and we're, we're going to be looking at that. And then down here, we have the luminescence. And the luminescence, I believe it was Sue, um, who asked today about the, or talked about the mica in paint. Well, the luminescence have mica. People say glitter, it's not glitter. Um, it's mica, M-I-C-A. I think in Europe you call it mica. Um, here we call it mica. And it's made for the car industry. If you've seen really beautiful cars and they're shiny, et cetera, and they sparkle. Um, I've seen quite a few people in the um, Lexus uh, uh, vehicles and they have pearlescent white, which I'll show you here in a moment. Um, that is a luminescent. So there's several families. So Catherine says she's new to DS last year. Thanks for your expertise. My pleasure, Catherine. Can can you find this chart anywhere in Canada? There's lots of um, lots of retailers that carry Daniel Smith in Canada, and Catherine, they should have access to it. So Claudia, no. Um, Claudia says, so if you add more water, if you add more water to an opaque, you will make it transparent. So yeah, on a, on a, on a chemistry basis, yes, but you're going to have to dilute it so much. It's not really going to be the color that you wanted it to be. So yes. Uh, but you'd really have to dilute it to make that happen. And that's kind of not really where you want to go. But I like your thinking. Yeah, so when Sandra says, I think it would be less opaque but not really transparent, yes, that, that's, ex that's exactly a great answer, Sandra. Oh. Um, so, so... Debbie says, can you add a symbol to the chart that denotes sparkle? That's really, really interesting. Um, on the chart, it's super easy because they're all, they're all under luminescent, except for um, a couple of colors that just naturally have mica in them. So, hello, Misha. So here, let's look at the luminescence because they're kind of interesting. So the luminescents are made up of several families. They're made up of the iridescent. This is iridescent. This is um, the iridescent over white and the iridescent over black. Little So outside, these will just kind of blow your mind. That's iridescent. You see them over white. You see them over dark. 
This is interference. Interference, hard to see over white, but you can see it over black. You can see it over dark green. You can see it over blue. Any, any type of dark color, you're going to be able to see it, and it's going to pop. Okay? That's, that's interference. There's duochrome, which is one pigment that shifts to two colors. Here you see it's blue, and here, in front of me anyway, it looks very green. And that's duochrome, means two. Very complex. And then the last one is pearlescent. And pearlescent just adds a shimmer. There's pearlescent shimmer and pearlescent. Um, they're both the same pigment, one just has a larger, larger particle size. Okay, so those are the, the four that can that constitute the luminescent. This is fuchsite, and fuchsite is a primatech, and you can see it is loaded with mica. And I will show you what this what this mineral looks like. It's just loaded with mica, both the red fuchsite and the green fuchsite. In fact, several of the primatechs have mica in them. Okay. Um, yes. So Latina says bronzeite genuine has sparkles. Yes, because it has it has mica. Absolutely. So it's it's so when we say transparent, it's true that that you're you're painting with a color. So it's true that the color, even though it's we say it's transparent, it doesn't mean it's invisible. It really means you can see another color or you can see what's underneath it. Um, so that's, that's a really good point. It's a good point. Um, okay. So we will be going over all of the colors. We'll go over all of the colors. Um, over the last um, year, um, Artis, Misha, Claudia, um, Giovanni, Stella, George, um, have asked wonderful questions, as you've asked wonderful questions. And what I'm going to try to do is incorporate those questions, because um, I thought they were really good. Um, and if you have questions, please let me know. All right. So we'll go over all 100, 260 colors. We will, we will mix them with other colors. I'll tell you information about the different families, the pyrroles, the perylenes, the quinacridones. Um, but it's really so, it's so important, I believe, that you know how to read a color chart because on an airplane at 50,000 feet, you can look at any of these symbols and you can understand what that color is going to do before you ever try it. It's just really, really powerful. Really, really powerful. And I think where I can provide you tools, um, it really makes me feel good because the more power you have, I think it just helps It helps you in your craft. So with that, I wanted to thank all of you for joining me today. I appreciate it so very, very much. I wish you and your family health and safety. I think we're almost at the I think we're kind of almost at the end of this um, pandemic. I'd love to, I just can't wait to come out and visit all of you again. I really miss you. Um, and with that, I'd like to say um, I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you for being with me, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody.